What's going on, beautiful people? Welcome back to week five of Community Permaculture. Glad y'all are joining us. Stoked to talk about soils this week. We are returning to the foundation this week and next week, soil and water, the two things we can't do without any of the stuff we're talking about, animals, humans, trees, plants, whatever. We need both of these things. We need to understand them. We need to be able to manage them better than we have before if we would like to impact our surroundings in any productive way. So um, I'd like to start, however, with the Anishinaabe or Ojibwe creation myth, or one of them, um, as I understand it, I am by no means an expert in this, but from what I've read, um, the idea of Turtle Island is one of the creation stories that whether it was um, a, a flood and one survivor, or it was a sky woman that fell from the sky, um, in any case, you had a human with surrounded by water, and they needed land, they needed some place to grow and live on, and through essentially an animal sacrificing itself. I've seen a lot of it, a muskrat diving down deep, pulling up water, dying in the process. Um, then the human or uh, God or whatever it was could use that to, they put that land on the back of a turtle. They put that earth, that mud in the sea on the back of a turtle. And um, right, maybe sounds crazy if you're thinking of that as a sort of newspaper article or a non-fictional account of what happened. Who knows? Um, but as a myth, uh, it seems to me to be a very sophisticated understanding of our world, of our belonging and our existence. And I'd like to discuss that a little bit to come from the last couple of weeks into this week with a framing or a context. So oftentimes um, you'll see in one of you know, a couple of these videos that we're watching, um, we need to start understanding the distinction between dirt on the one hand and soil on the other and as i understand it dirt is essentially a geological phenomenon dirt is uh, dust particles and broken up rock um, fundamentally right there might be some other stuff but it's non-living organic matter if there's organic matter in it um, soil on the other hand is an active biological phenomenon and to understand as this native american myth does the ground we're walking on as founded not just on the the soil or the geologic strata but also on the animal life that is beneath that soil or that geologic geology and the water uh, that is filling out this whole context so as we move from discussing animals into discussing water um, this soil medium right this this turtle in a way is the link that's the, the connecting piece between, um, at least in my class narrative. But I think to me, it sounds like a very sophisticated understanding um, that our existence here, our planting crops, um, our, you know, all our livelihood depends on animals and water in addition to or in interaction with the soil. So that's kind of it put very simply the point of this course uh, in writ large, uh, beautifully, poetically put in that myth. Um, I am by no means an expert in Native American mythology. Please just Google, you know, Native American myth, uh, Turtle Island to explore that on your own more. There's a ton of cool stories out there. A lot of variation from what I've seen, um, as happens with myths, a lot of different retellings and tellings. Um, and in that, I'm sure there's a lot more to be gleaned and understood from this myth and appreciated about it. Um, but that's what I got so far. And I think it's a great way to to move us yeah, into a deeper understanding of what's beneath our feet, not just as this rocky stuff we stand on or this sandy stuff that we you know, get in our hair and, and have to brush off our feet before we get in the car because we don't want to take that home because that's bad or something. Whatever these, these concepts of, of, of sort of this dead matter beneath our feet right, need to be, I think, opened up with a more biological, a more life web sort of view of things. And that's what I think that myth does. So uh this this week we're going to geek out we're going to get into some deep soil science i've essentially broken our our uh watch list into sort of four sections the first two are just um introductory soil science sort of some repetitive stuff there's ideas in there you're going to see again and again but there's also variation in each one of those videos um, the first five are maybe, you know, 10 minute or so in uh, each introductions to the idea of why soil is important. And they're very watchable, they're very popularized, they're very accessible. So 
Um, I would highly recommend if you're feeling, you know, like you still need to get some footing in this idea to watch as many of those as you can. Um, the second set of five videos is from this lady, Elaine, Dr. Elaine Ingham. She's a famous soil scientist, compost enthusiast, and expert. And she has a, a school called the Soil Food Web School. And um, these videos are all from that. They all have like a little tag at the end. It, it's clearly directed towards farmers. So, you know, you can ignore that the last 30 seconds or whatever of most of these videos. But um, super helpful information. And I want to zero in on one of them in particular. It's the one on nutrient cycling. I put a little star next to it. Um, that I think, from what I've understood, captures some of her unique contributions to the field of understanding soil. So what is a soil food web, right? We often hear about the food chain and chains are hierarchical, you know, single direction, unidirectional uh, ideas, right? At least the food chain as we understand it. And uh, we see our food pyramid or whatever. That's that kind of, a lot of these are, uh, are trophic pyramids, trophic levels, et cetera. They're these unidirectional ideas that the, the way, you know, the, sardine eats the plankton and the tuna eats the sardine and the dolphin eats the tuna and the blah 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 right it's a unidirectional thing in the soil food web it's a more dynamic network sort of idea of how nutrients are cycling around in all these complicated ways but i think the simple takeaway for me is that it's not just a question of having bacteria in the soil it's not just a question of having fungi in the soil right we've got these different uh, animal kingdoms and trophic levels and all these things involved but on their own they are not necessarily sufficient even as she says just bacteria and just fungi they don't do the trick to grow plants plants co-evolved with soil being full of a very complicated web of life such that uh, let me just describe one of the processes as i understand it as she describes it Plants send out signals to bacteria or fungi to go mine minerals out of rocks that they might need. So um, those then, I've heard lots, of, I don't know all the terms correctly, but lithophage and different ways that those sort of beings can pull nutrients out of rocks. The plants then can't directly necessarily in many cases access those nutrients as is in their bacterial or fungal form. They actually need predators that go around like um, protozoa say that eat the bacteria nematodes that eat the whatever um, that or f you know fungi phages or whatever eats fungi right that then while eating and digesting the little miners that the plant set out poop out excrement that has the digested bacteria in it which now uh, those minerals that the plant asked the bacteria to mine are in bioavailable form uh, that the plant can uptake essentially so um, all that to say, plants grow from animals interacting, from the animals and fungi and eukaryota and all these the kingdoms or whatever, interacting in predation, in grazing, right? And what is grazing? Grazing is essentially, you know, herbivory can be predation, right? Car carnivorous animals aren't the only predators out there, right? When a deer goes out and eats all your... Uh, your weed plants or your lettuce or whatever, they are pred predating on that, right? So you need this cycle of predation and uh, digestion that unlocks these nutrients from what is essentially just biology and makes them available now to us on the higher trophic levels of the system to eat. So it was the bacteria that took the thing from the rock and then the nematode or the, the plasma or whatever, the, the, the protozoa that ate the bacteria that then died itself or excreted or was eaten by a nematode or was et cetera, et cetera, that all this debt, life and death and, and animal interaction with geology makes that plant then able to mine those nutrients. And the, we can't necessarily just even eat the soil ourselves and get all the nutrients we need. We need that other intermediary often of a plant then taking up those nutrients and making it a, in a form that we can absorb it in. So are animals necessary to uh, a regenerative future? Yes. I think to me, the definitive answer from last week is yes. Whether Alan Sabry's methods are the right methods, whether White Oak Farms and blah, blah, or pastures or whatever is doing it the best or not, that's up for debate. Whether we need to then ourselves murder and eat those animals, 
that's also a debate. I think even though I myself eat plant-based, I'm not 100% settled on that debate yet. But either way, should we just genocide all the cows in order to save the planet from their farts and methane? No, not at all. I think uh, I'm going to pop out a little quote, get geeky on you. This is the permaculture, essentially I think the permaculture designer's manual, but in a different package. It's called a practical permaculture, a practical guide for a sustainable future. It's probably versed on the camera, huh? But Bill Mollison, he is one of the founders of this concept of permaculture, and this is a great text. Um, just want to read this. This is pulling up from week three and week four on the discussion of humans. Are they beneficial for our environment or not? It depends on how they're interacting. Are animals beneficial for the environment or not? It depends on how they're used. So just to reinforce that idea, we can arrange any set of parts and design a system which may be self-destructive or which needs energy support, a la the lawns right, that are in our suburban neighborhoods where we need to bring in uh, tons of fertilizer, pesticides, we need machines, diesel-powered machines, men and people, you know, often men, but all kinds of people coming in and blowing, chopping and running over the grass and blowing it up in the air and doing all these things, all this energy input to maintain this artificial system. Um, but by using the same parts in a different way, say if those people, um, gardeners, were actually gardening, actually growing food for consumption uh, or for medicine or for ecological purposes, um, those machines might be different. We might not need to use as much pesticides, fertilizers, or if any, and we definitely would not need a ton of diesel-powered machines, right? Um, so using the same parts in a different way, we can equally well create a harmonious system which nourishes life. It is in the arrangement of parts that design has its being and function, and it is the adoption of a purpose which, decide, which decides the direction of the design. So, um, a, lot of, a lot in there, but also fairly straightforward and simple, right? It's not the animals that are the problem, it's not the humans that are the problem, it's the how. And um, having that how guided by a purpose, as he adds at the end there, is kind of the crucial point. So. Um, if the purpose of our being here and the purpose of animals being here is to nourish and replenish soil, I think we've got it. We, we've understood the point. And if in doing so, in nourishing and replenishing that soil, we nourish and replenish the hydrological cycle, um, we are connecting the full dots. So to me, that's why in the middle of the course, right, weeks five and six, we're kind of going down to the foundational level, soil and water. These two things we need to understand on a detailed, deep level. So um, after that chunk of five videos from the Soil, soil, food, school, soil food Web School, um, I have some deep dive stuff. So that's about an hour, just that first stuff. If you just kind of want to get your feet wet, that's a great hour to watch, basically. If you have time and you really want to geek out, the deep dive section is... Uh, one of my favorite permaculture thinkers, Toby Hemingway, a few things from him, um, including a great article um, that gets real geeky. And if you read the full series of articles, it's a three part. It gets real cosmic. It's, it's kind of rad. Um, and then a, a really cool soil taxonomy thing that I don't uh, I think it w might not be in the playlist. There's a few videos on here that might not be in the playlist as well as a few articles. So do check the email because um, not all this is YouTube stuff. There's a, a global soil taxonomy map, so if you really want to geek out, and then I just threw it in here. We're going to talk a little bit about this more later, but in case you want to uh, get ahead of yourself, the secret of El Dorado, Terra Preta, it's about essentially how ancient civilizations in the Amazon created soil that has literally outlasted every building and every, like, it's soil that literally regenerates itself. In Brazil, it's called Terra Preta, I think, ready earth, right? Because a lot of that Amazonian soil is really nutrient poor. But by using essentially clay from bro you know, broken clay pottery shards and charcoal from burning wood in certain ways and doing burns, controlled burns, um, essentially these might have been ancient trash heaps from these civilizations. They've created soil that has literally stood the test of time and become a living organism, right? It's so that Terra Preta final video there shows how, shows in a very clear way that soil is biology. Soil is also geology, but dirt is geology just alone. Soil is biology primarily. That's what makes it distinct from rock, right? 
So that's a, a basic overview of those. The last section is just um, just a, a link for you in Instagram and a, a link to their website of a local thing because I always want to have something local you can do. And in this case, this is LB Community Compost. So if you're in Long Beach um, and you have food scraps and you don't have a space to put them, you don't have a place to do any composting, they are people who can help, right? I think they might even do some pickup, excuse me, but you can definitely bring them your food scraps, save them up and bring them in. Um, I think they do, yeah. I know some services do pick up too. Um, so check your local listings. I'm sure there's a compost service somewhere around you if your city doesn't yet do it. I believe Long Beach is getting green bins. I think that's a new thing. I think it might already be in place. I don't know I don't know if we've got them yet, but we're, it's coming. So Long Beach is on the move, but they've been doing it from before Long Beach had green bins. They've been on the move. So thank you, LB Community Compost, for what you do. Y'all are rad. Um, Really, that's uh, what we need to be doing right now is instead of turning our food scraps into methane by putting them in, you know, uh, landfills where they're going to anaerobically digest and turn into toxic sludge in certain senses, um, we should be taking anything that's not, doesn't have, you know, ideally plastic, styrofoam, pesticides, etc., and all that organic matter, turning it back into soil. And, you know, they'll talk about in these soil videos about how it takes 500 years to make two centimeters of topsoil, and that is true. That's through natural processes. That is absolutely true. Um, if any of y'all saw the movie, I believe I recommended it's in, should be in the recommended videos, um, The Need to Grow. You'll see how um, through using biochar and algae intelligently, we can essentially make tons of topsoil and capture tons of carbon relatively quickly. quickly. So... Um, humans are part of, while we cause the problem, again, I'm repeating this idea, but it's really crucial. We are a part of the solution, just as we have had this capacity to massively, uh, exceed our carrying capacity and destroy things using, you know, essentially cheating by using old carbon, uh, using non-renewable energy sources. We have the same power to do something exponentially regenerative. And that's the hope that I have to hold on to. I hope that I can spread this hope to y'all. Hope some of this education, some of these videos are helpful. I hope some of this is sinking in. If you've watched this far, I appreciate you. If you have any feedback, I would love to hear what you think. I would love to hear any suggestions on how to, um, you know, do this better, uh, videos or topics you want covered. So, yeah, that's about it. Soil. Soil is, is uh, uh, the stuff of life. And this is an opportunity to really get to know it. Um, one quick reminder, uh, there is way more life under soil than there is often on top of soil. So in forests, I think it's up to, you know, 10 to 1 or more, um, you know, the all, total amount of birds, possums, rats, etc., animals, uh, the, as there are animals beneath, right? There are 10 times more s stuff going on, life, biological stuff moving. In good farmland, uh, it's up there as well, you know, even in not that great farmland, it's, you know, twice as much or whatever. So, um it's the unseen biology that really makes all our biology possible. And I want y'all to get to know that a little bit. So enjoy. <laughs>